Gurpreet, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, buddy. Yeah, good evening. Okay, today we have with us a mentor and a master instructor that needs no introduction. We all know him as GD, the Guru, Gurpreet Dhinsa. He has many podium finishes in XE comps in Europe and India. And we all know this about him, but I would like to add that Gurpreet is a painter, he's a traveler, a kite surfer, a diver. And to top the list, he has won himself the title of the Iron Butt. For those who don't know, he rode 1,600 <laughs> kilometers on his bike in 24 hours. I, I, I use this as a ghost now. <laughs> yeah? So is that what the Iron Butt rests on now? <laughs> yeah, it's on my table and I, I use it as a ghost. <laughs> so, uh, before we get to the paragliding aspect of it, Gurpreet, I'd like to ask you, how do you manage to do all these things in such little time, you know? And knowing you, I know you do it with passion, not as a hobby. Uh, one day at a time, I think, one thing at a time. I'm, one day I'm, at a time. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm old man, I'm 54. <laughs> I had many days. So one day at a time, many things. <laughs> okay. I ride horses also, by the way. Um, like swimming naked in all the natural water bodies that I can find. <laughs> that, 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 that's got to know, and you got some naughty questions coming up. Huh? <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, back to our paragliding. Uh, can you please explain to us the dynamics of a thermal and the surrounding air? Yeah, uh, today's um, the, the, the subject is going to be, it's not so theoretical, it's, it's actually, um, we're going to find a shortcut to understand the nature of the air, how to visualize it. Yeah. Right? What, what is a model that I have found over the years, which kind of takes into account uh, the major factors and has held true in most of the applications um, I've seen in competition and everything. Even if at the time of flying, I couldn't explain something and I bombed out. But later, if I thought it clearly, the same model explained what went wrong, why I landed. So sometimes uh, they say there is no losing. Either you win or you learn. So <laughs> if you don't make goal, you yeah, land yeah. and you think what went wrong and at least learn. If you don't learn, then that is losing. Yeah. So this model, I had... Um, um, fortune to discuss with Bob Drury also coffee, you know, like uh, about 10 years back and uh, he thought the model had value and we were going to do it for cross country but then he uh, left as editor and I was supposed to do illustrations which I never did. Yeah. So uh, it has never taken a formal shape but it uh, has been taught to my students. Uh, so people who have done XC course with me are already familiar with it but for sake of everybody I'll share it. So, um, how I split it is that air has three natures. Um, one is, uh, let's say this is packet of air. Okay. It has three natures. One is the easiest one, that is the dynamic push. We will call it just push. Right. Uh, second is uh, the lift part. That if it's hot, it will try to rise up. I'll call it pull upwards. I'll explain to you why I call it pull and not lift or something like that. Okay. Um, and third thing is a small magnet under it. Let's say there's a rope and you tie a magnet here, but it's a magnet that attracts to ground. So it's a stickiness. This is the third property is cohesion or stickiness. I and E double S. Right? Right. So these three things can explain most of the behavior of it. Easiest out of this is the push element, the dynamic, because we can feel it on the takeoff. We can feel how much wind is there. So some days it's more push, some days it's less push. Right. Right. Uh, this one we can feel. Uh, it depends on the heating of the air, but also depends on the surrounding air, what the behavior, the in instability of air. So this one you can feel when you fly first two, three thermals, you can feel how lifty it is today. Right? So this part is also 
Um, if not before takeoff, you can easily guess it a few minutes after takeoff. Right. This is the tricky part. The stickiness, right? You must have seen like even flying uh, in beer, uh, but beer is a little bit more predictable, but uh, people who have been abroad with us like uh, Macedonia, Bulgaria, some days it's very, very apparent that thermals are triggering much outside and the better line is outside. And some days the lift is more towards the main spine, like shoulders or spine. The lift, the thermals behind on the main mountains are much better than the outside ones, right? Okay. So both of them have something to do with it. The, the push can take it more inside or more stickiness can take it more inside, right? But you have to do a deduction. You can feel the push, right? So you can deduce, ah, it's not windy. So if still main ridge is working better, then that means air is more sticky, right? Now, how to visualize it? We think of thermal as a one uniform air mass. It's not like that. And we have a very good example. You're driving on a hot road, particularly in summers in a hot place, and you can see hot air rising up. Yeah, right. yeah, the From reflection, yeah, you yeah. can see it. It creates yeah. mirage also. And how does yeah. it rise? It rises in waving and yeah. packets. Like you can think of, so think of it as many, many such packets, many balloons, right? right? Rising up, but not leaving very far because of what? The viscosity, the stickiness. So when, when we have uh, uh, differential heating, one uh, spot of ground gets hotter than the surrounding then the air above it starts getting heated. But it's not one bubble, it con consists of many, many balloons. And some balloons are bigger, some balloons are smaller. Like when I say bigger, that means they are hotter, they have more pull right. upwards, right? And some balloons are smaller, they're not so desperate to rise, they're, they're colder, right? And of course, around there are blue balloons also. So you can think red balloons, yellow balloons, blue balloons, right? Yeah. Blue ones are to rise. The yellow ones moderately, the red ones very much so, right? And now you think, you think of, let's say, a terrain. You have a slope of a mountain here, there's some uh, ridge lines going down, right? And air is coming. It has these packets. Now, the red ones want to rise up. So let's say air is coming like this. It should meet the terrain and actually, like uh, in dynamic, get towards the, the bow, the valley, right? Yeah. But when the red ones come to the slope, it's easier for them to ride up because they have more tendency. The magnet is still yeah. sticking them to the ground, push is pushing them, but their tendency is to go towards the steepest yeah. terrain, right? right? So these balloons will come this way, the blue ones will go this way. Right. And the red ones will be coming up a steeper slope, the yellow ones go in between, and the blue ones will go yeah. inside, right? Similarly, if along this slope also, there were different shapes, then you can see some will come here, some will come here, all of them will rise, they will make the roots of the thermal and then from the trigger point, they'll make a yeah. thermal, right? Correct. So you now understand why there are different roots and right. how the lift would move. And also you can see thermic air, when it's coming along the surface, it will not, like dynamic air, when it's more push element, it presses against the surface and rises. Right. Right. So the lift is better close to surface. Okay. Right. But then if, if it's more red and yellow balloons, they will go further away from the surface. They will not stick so much. Yeah. Because their tendency is to rise and this cost is keeping them, but they want to rise. Right. So thermic lift is not close to surface. Thermic lift yeah. will be slightly yeah. away. Yeah. And then similarly, when now thermal is rising here, right? It's again, many balloons, red balloons, yellow balloons, and orange balloons also in between, right? Wind is pushing it. So what's going to happen? The red balloons will continue more vertical path. Absolutely. The orange will get a little bit washed and follow here. Yeah. And the yellow ones follow yeah. back here. Behind, yeah. Around, this air is cutting around all this, mixing up with the end and have yeah. turbulence behind. Right. You see a better model evolves. Yeah. And similarly, if wind is wavering, it's a little fast and then slow, fast and slow, you can see it can easily create branches also. Right. Right? So yeah. that's what something happens. We are in the same thermal, but one part that gets stuck, other one is a little further away and continues to go high. Why? Because you took up one of the branch, which yeah. was created by these orange balloons or yellow balloons going a little bit more with the wind. Right. So this model kind of explains a lot more. Yeah. 
Right? So uh, now thing is with, with stickiness. So stickiness, I couldn't find any mathematical model or, or scientific data so far which explains uh, cohesive forces like stickiness with the ground. Uh, but my own practical experience is that it's kind of a, a curve, a U curve. Okay. Right, or uh, uh, you go like this because when air is very cold, it's not sticky. It's okay. brittle. So in winters, I've seen as the air gets very cold, the thermals trigger a little bit outside. Okay. Moderately warm air is more sticky, the thermals move inside. And when summer comes, now May, June, the thermals again move outside. Again, the air gets less sticky. Okay. Humid air is more sticky. Obviously, it feels like that. Um, it's sluggish and sticky, so it's different. So this is my practical experience. I couldn't find any data as such to um, bring to you scientifically. This is what I've learned over the years. So uh, this is uh, the model that I generally teach to explain thermals. So if you now, uh, you can ask me questions first about what I explained, and then you can ask me a situation and we can try applying the model to explain the situation. Uh, okay, so just to put in a nutshell, Gurpreet, what I've understood so far regarding the thermal model is that the stronger cores, what we call the red balloons, they would be more upwind. Yeah. Uh, correct? As in, as, correct. as in how the the rising air becomes weaker, you know, it starts drifting back downwind of the thermal, and that's where it starts losing its uh, its energy. Am I right? No, no, no. What I meant was that... Sorry, it has been... Um, that as the thermal rises, like this is the thermal, let's say, yeah. and there's some, right? So these bigger balloons will try to follow a straight path, and then the smaller balloons will be washed away a little bit like this, and the very weak balloons, they will be like this, because some will drift more, some will drift less. So the air comes, cuts around, and here you get better winds. If you come from this side, first the weak lift. A lot of people hit the first lift, and they keep turning here only. And they miss that the best thermal is a little bit yes. on the upwind side. So it's always better to check the upwind boundary of the thermal and then start turning. If you came from, side, came from side or you came from behind, like downwind side of the thermal, always check the upwind boundary of the thermal and then make some boundary in your mind. Excellent. And also you can understand, I'll, I'll explain a few other things like bubbles, how the, when you have broken thermals, how this theory will apply there, we'll talk later. But uh, you can also understand um, the, the core, the, with, the, sometimes the core is not in the one place, core sometimes is here, you circle and then it, you lose it. Because sometimes some balloons will go this way and the wind increases a little bit, they will go this way. So it, it you have to constantly search where the best core would be. It will not stay in the one place. It's a, that it's was a uh, actually my next question to you, Gurpreet. I mean, uh, how is the thermal formation affected in the different shear layers of wind? You know, uh, with the different layers of wind, it is getting blown up in different directions. And uh, how do you go about identifying it? Uh, going above the inversion, you mean? Uh, so if we take the example of Panchgani, so if we like climb 400 uh, meters, the wind is in a different direction, the thermal is suddenly changing its breadth. In, in Panchgani, it's, see, there's one very clear uh, cut off line. There. One, I don't have that much experience of Panchgani. I've only flew there many years back and few times only. But what I can see from being there is that there are winds below the, the mountain line, the valleys. Yes. Right, that is very different. It's more decided by the shape of the valleys, and just above the plateaus, then the wind, the main prevailing wind is there. I don't think there are much layers above that, except when there is inversion. So there is the valley uh, protected winds, and then they're above the plateau winds. Absolutely. There's only two major winds there. Okay. So as far as I know, you, you can correct me because I, I don't have that much experience of that place. Okay. So we'll open the forum for to people if they need to ask any questions. Yeah. yeah. Uday, can you please? Uh, anybody has any questions, please? Participants can unmute themselves once uh, they call out. Uh, KK, you can call out people and they can unmute themselves to ask a question. 
pilots if you have any questions you can unmute yourself uh, kk i have a question rohit here yeah rohit please hi grupit uh, the question that i have is uh, on different days uh, let's take a a decent day uh, in be it october 3 meter per second um, some days you would find a similar day like that some day you will find a very edgy thermal that means the boundary between a uh, uh, good thermal and the sink area is very sharp you get a lot of turbulence when you leave the thermal or when you approach the thermal or sometimes it can be very gradual uh, is there anything uh, that we can look at this model and understand that uh, yeah the same thing the, the stickiness changes that also defines the boundaries the thermal will have because it's a cohesive forces when i say stickiness if i use precise science that is a cohesive forces so when the stickiness is more the boundaries are uh, with the with the cohesive forces are also moving along there is a gradual change and when the stickiness is less actually there is sharper change so when thermal would be triggering outside more better that would be uh, sharper thermals more turbulent and it's a day which is not so good outside but better on the spine then it's going to be generally uh, mellow thermals all right also and as as it gets colder Uh, the edges get sharper also okay and does pressure has a correlation with the stickiness um, i think we did talk about humidity and the temperature no, no. um uh, we, pressure doesn't have pressure has something to do with the uh, instability what surrounding air is doing we will come to that later on okay. Uh, okay. i just described thermal but of course thermal will not go up till the surrounding air is pushing it up so that is the instability of the atmosphere we can discuss it a little bit later and then you can ask me this one question again if you don't sure sure okay. thanks a lot yeah right. uh pilots anybody else has a question okay let's take it a little further yeah. then uh next is basically morning to progression during the day how the thermal shapes change during the day or with the sun the amount of sun coming it's a bit basic i think this part is nothing new as we um, i generally given a, a example of uh, a tap that um, our tap is basically our sun or the heating of the ground so um you have a tap and you open it slowly right what happens first is that you start getting drops right similarly as the day starts so first you start getting bubbles the the, the surface heats up the these packets of air heat up and they travel to a trigger point and release but after it releases still not enough heat here for continuation of the it takes a time for another packet to form and then packet travels and you, so you get bubbles you have one cycle come some launch people launch and then they stay with it the next people launch they find nothing they go down so that generally happens in the morning right so that's bubble so this part is easy to understand but what you need to understand is the nature of the bubble so basically if we have a ground and a trigger point and here we formed a packet of warm air everybody can see it to here a little more to the right please now it's okay right yeah so we have a packet of hot air here which is many many balloons as we described right and is there some wind let's say so wind carries it towards the trigger point so it's this is kind of anabatic influence that happens along the slope with the wind uh, the dynamic wind and it comes to the trigger point from trigger point it releases we, we already uh, went over that Uh, that small magnets under are not that strong so when it comes to a sharp point it's easy, easily overcome it and it starts to rise now if it was a bubble it will rise up like this but what will happen inside the bubble is that balloon packets which hit the still air they will slow down right there there's a cold air above there is inertia but this cold so these packets will slow down and slip to the side right actually they don't descend this is moving up 
it's more like um, like like cigarette rings that you blow uh, the bubble is going up the it slows the upper layer slows the inside like gears moving so it's like upward motion like this like this right okay. so inside is rising outside slows down stays there and then goes up the bubble comes here then it goes up right so there along the surface there is motion like this outwards so it's like a donut right rising yeah. up so this also explains some day you come and you hit a lift and you don't do anything you go rising up don't need to turn moment you try to turn you fall out of it doesn't matter which side you turn okay like right? that's a typical day with the big donuts the bubbles and also explains why good pilots because they core better in this area they can go up with the bubble because they inside it's rising outside it stays slows down then inside is rising if you stay with the fast part of the bubble you can continuously go up. don't drop out of it right theoretically we always fall out of whatever air we are flying because you're going down 1 meter per second yeah in this case you stay with the fast part inside of the bubble if you stay with the outside part you will fall out if you get a core it better you can go up with the bubble if you hit the bubble here on the outside of the donut if you come here you flying here and you hit this you will feel that going up without having to turn right moment you try to turn you fall out so you have to identify that it happens to you once next one if it same thing happens just stay there because it's giving you a headwind right and when you feel that you are inside and it's kind of not really giving you headwind your speed is increasing you don't feel still and going up then you can start turning don't turn before that right so uh, that that some sometimes people are get very confused why you know i used to for years i couldn't understand why this happens you hit something and going up you want to tumble there the moment you start to turn you fall out right so this is what's happening so with bubbles it's very important to realize which part you hit if you hit from here from the side not this will not happen this will only happen from upper outer edge if you come this part of the bubble not not here this will not give you the same feeling here it will feel like normal thermal and you need to find the core quickly otherwise you will drop out of the bubble so morning why the two, like i think debu was asked this question sorry debu but i am going to elaborate on that um, like morning what is the trick the trick is better thermal one this one factor second trick is the particular in billing in morning in the valleys the gullies above the air is from the night before so that air has been cooled down at night humidity has dropped out of it has dew and it's a dry air right so the dew point of the dry air is generally higher so one you need the skill to core the bubbles if you score the bubbles the dew point is much higher so morning group always goes higher and then later on the cloud base comes blow and blow sometimes it comes so much lower that they cannot cross over and go to the back but the first group does right yeah. because the more morning dry air which is inside those gullies is much drier and the dew point is higher and then from the valley comes more humid air and the dew point is much lower so you need two skills one you need the timing to use the dry air so first flush i call it so you have to use the first flush if you miss it the dew point is going to be lower after that and second is you should be able to core inside a bubble if you drop out then you can't use it you will be going down so this is the the bubble so next what will happen we open the tap a little bit more yeah other thing what kind of if it's bubble day what kind of clouds will form so when it's a bubble day this bubble came up and what kind of cloud it form of course it forms cumulus only but what will happen you form a cumulus a small one then the bubble has formed the cumulus and then the next one is further away 
by the time this one happens this cloud would drift somewhere this one will get diffused because now it's dying and the next one will start to form here yeah. when this this bubble comes up then next cloud will start forming here yeah. it will be smaller so you will have cumulus form start moving decay another where the cumulus formed earlier the same place another cumulus will form small one and grow big then start moving and decay so where should you go to the smallest thermal with with the uh, smallest cloud with the with the growing shape right and growing is clear the the boundaries of the growing cloud would be crisp and decaying clouds will be diffused so it's easier to identify so you go for the smaller forming cloud and don't go for the big one and this is happening right next step is when we open the tap little bit more the sun gets stronger and we getting more supply of hot air what do we get we get pulses we get water fall and then tap 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 gap then water fall so it's similar similar to bubble except that the gaps would be small less people will uh, have problem finding the thermal and for a while you feel like you're not in the thermal if you go looking somewhere else you'll miss the bus and that's what happens people search too much sometimes so you have to uh, trust your theory trust your instinct if there's a trigger point there was a thermal above you go to the same place and stick around there only don't go searching too much remember sometimes there's a gap between the pulses or the bubbles so you don't go searching too much if you search too much also you must miss the bus you you one bubble was coming one bullet gained height you went to same place bubble has gone nothing happened and you went away you lost confidence in this trigger point and you went away and second bubble the second bus also passed you came back you missed that also right so sometimes searching too much being too nervous not knowing the concept where to find thermal that also creates a problem so you need to trust your trigger points and your concepts right right so stick around there wait for the bus to come it will come then this is particularly true early in the morning or later in the day so now when from bubble it becomes pulses so only thing that changes in pulses is that uh, a cloud instead of being separate clouds it becomes a sharp growing part a big part and decaying part right but the best lift would be here not under the biggest part right because this is the new pulse coming this is the old result of the old pulse Right. So don't go by the under the biggest part of the cloud. Go under the yeah the youngest part. Right now it, it's not separating. Now it's become one cloud. Right. And then of course you open the tap, and it becomes a proper what I call honest to God thermal. It doesn't have any breaks. It takes you right up to the cloud base. <laughs> right. So <clears throat> now with this thing you can also understand. um bubbles get more difficult because each bubble is not the same size or same amount of pull in it right some of them are smaller some of them are bigger so they will they they are releasing from a trigger point wind is affecting them push is affecting them the stronger one will go a little bit upwind weaker one will go and there's no continuation between them they separate patterns so it becomes broken you you search over a bigger area and you find somewhere here sometimes here and it's you, you understand that kind of day now you we all felt that we felt that like there's no where is the thermal where is the thermal we look around and sometimes it's good here sometimes it's good there and now this visualization this concept of three forces it, it explains that what kind of day it is it can also happen because of too much wind right supply is good tap is open but the wind is fast so wind will break up the column so in those cases this is what happens you have a, so whenever it's broken you cannot expect the next lift to be exactly at the same place you have to continuously feel with your wind tip and go where you where you feel the better lift to be right right so this is the second part so now time for questions again <laughs> Okay, Preeti has a question. Preeti, yeah, Preeti, can unmute yourself. Preeti, do you hear us?
Nikhil has a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Nikhil. Hi, Gurpreet. Uh, my question is, you just explained about a maturing cloud and a decaying cloud. Uh, are yeah. there any, can you, can you help us with some techniques to identify which is a, a, a forming cloud and how to separate it from a decaying cloud? I often get confused between both because they look kind of similar, but they clearly aren't. It's quite, um, Nickel, more experience, but general guideline is the edges of the, of the cloud only. Sharp edges is a going cloud and diffused edges is the decaying cloud. Even the same cloud, the sharp side is the forming side and the diffuse side of the same cloud is the, the sink side or the diffusing side where there wouldn't be any lift. So generally edges of the cloud, not the size, not so much. We are talking about cumulus only in both cases. Um, not the size, not the, the shape or anything. It's look at the edges of the cloud. If they're sharp, crisp, then that is the forming cloud. And if it's diffused, it's a decaying cloud. And also, if it's a big cloud, then you want to see where the uh, which part is forming. Second clue is that the cloud base would be slightly higher on the forming side. Does okay. that make sense okay. to anybody? <laughs> Can somebody explain to me why the cloud base would be higher where the thermal is hitting? It's like a spoon. The rest of the cloud will be like this. And where the thermal is actually hitting, it will be slightly curved shape, slightly. It's not like my hand, even it's very difficult to see, but you can see it mostly. That the cloud base is slightly higher on that side. This, oh. this, does ring, this does ring a bell because I usually notice, so if it's a forming cloud, usually the edges have kind of, uh, not actually rotors, but it looks like the, the cloud is circling inwards. It's like a kind of a spiral-like shape. Is, is yeah, that, that, that that sometimes happens that happens only when there's a lot of uh, even at the dew point if the thermal is still going fast enough then you will see the the, the boiling effect otherwise it's not so apparent when you're flying because you're moving yourself also and you get, don't get that time interval to understand mostly the, the, the edges the crispiness against the sky the edge of a forming cloud would look crisper sharper like freshly drawn not spray painted and the diffuse uh, the not forming side the decaying side or the decaying cloud will look spray painted not drawn with a pencil got it got it that answers thank you thank you very much yeah uh, and good, again, good uh, yeah nickel about that why the cloud base would be higher because the thermic air is few degrees warmer like degree and a half or even less so the dew point will come few meters higher Okay, I just got it. That's why it will be slightly higher. Makes sense. Makes sense. Could be the yeah. continuation of the same boiling effect. This uh, we've seen sometimes at Panchgani. And uh, in that situation, it has been really, really turbulent because my conclusion over here was it is a different uh, wind layer that is going at that level. And it is causing all the turbulence at that moment. And whenever I see such effects, I used to avoid. And it, it has just been the experience that it has been really turbulent at that level for us. But uh, would you throw some light on it? What, what could happen uh, air-wise at that moment if the boiling effect is happening? Yeah, uh, generally my um, theory about this is, the, the one thing else I need to explain to you is that if the inversion is few meters lower than the dew point, like even 100, 200, 300 meters lower than the dew point, then the cloud will form at the inversion layer, not at the dew point. Do you get that? Okay. okay. Right? Yeah. That means uh, now cloud base is forming at inversion layer. Inversion layers are turbulent. So in that day, you will have more turbulent <clears throat> close to the base. Mm -hmm. It's not going, like it has energy to go 300 meters more. But the, the pollution at the inversion level is making it condense earlier. So it has energy still, right? And it produces turbulence uh, very, very, uh, like the, you will feel like it's being capped. It's not really easy. It's not breathing freely. It doesn't have enough space. There will be a cap on the energy and it will feel, it's like a river going through a canyon. It's, it's trapped. Hmm. So uh, the energy is kind of boiling, effect is there. So that happens if the cloud base is forming at inversion layer, and which generally happen if you look at the forecast, if the dew point is slightly above the inversion, you always see cloud base falling to the dew point, always. 
Okay. Never seen at the at the theoretical viewpoint, but come the base will come to the, the inversion layer. And inversion layer, you know, they are they are turbulent because they trap the warm air. It doesn't let it go where it wants to go. So uh, that's mostly the explanation for those days. Um, generally, if you can fly and still see the cloud boiling, it means it, the air. It, it was still moving pretty far and not because of the cloud suck. See, cloud suck is something different. Cloud suck is creating space. It's like, right, there's already vacuum there. So air goes in easy, right? But on the other hand, if there was a cap, right, and the, cloud, the air wants to go further up, but yeah. it's the, something is keeping it slightly below, then it will hit with some energy. It's not getting a free space there. So you will have turbulent base at that time and you'll see boiling. Yeah. And that can, so it can happen with high pressure restitution, but mostly due to inversion also. Okay. So, if, I mean, watch out. We can use a feedback on that. So, next time that happens, check if the dew point and the inversion layer were very close to Different. Together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's of course, different, I... we can discuss it yeah. a little further. And I can use other people collecting data also instead of me only having my experiences. So we have a theory, this is a hypothesis, this is not a complete, uh, I don't have yeah. a mind over this, yeah. it's only a hypothesis. And if you feel it's not so, we'll discuss it yeah. further. Yeah, also uh, at the place where it happens, uh, it has happened at the same place twice uh, with me. And, uh, and the wind from the other valley, the wind, uh, I always had a conclusion, okay, it is because of the winds coming from the other valley. It's a different system over there, it's working. And maybe it is that reason that is causing this. And- uh, This is, this is Panchkadi, right? Yes. And did it happen closer to the west side? Like Mahabaleshwar, slightly behind? No, no, it is, no, no, no not towards the west, no, west no. side, uh, more towards the northish side of uh, the Panjgani ridge line. And uh, uh, so th there is a divide, there's a Khandala Ghat that goes around there. And uh, on the other side of the Ghat, the, the, the base, the ground base is a little lower. And on the Panjgani side, the base is a little higher and more greenish. The other side is more brownish and uh, um, so my conclusion was okay. Maybe it's a different two different kinds of air masses that are coming in together, and uh, can, see all all convergence are turbulent. Hmm. But now you're saying turbulent at cloud base, so I'm just only taking that. If it was turbulent at most of the altitude, like except for a few meters off the ground, then it's the convergence. Hmm. Convergences are not easy place to fly. Don't think of them as gentle because. Higher up, yes, they get gentle, but initially they come and strike like this, and then they form into this. So where it's more like this, this side will go smoother, and this yeah. side will come like so it will produce turbulence. So lower up, up, higher up, they get smooth, but convergence is generally turbulent at lower level. I mean, even up to like from ground 1500 meters, 1700 meters, it's turbulent. Then 2000 meters onward, it's easy. Yeah. So it, it was just a weird behavior that we had at two six, two seven sometimes, and uh, we couldn't explain more, it ourselves. Buddy, uh, let's take this hypothesis. If it explains, fine. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. I'll also think about it if I feel there was any other factor we missed right now. Yeah. So sometimes it's not easy to think of everything. Yeah. Right on the spot. So, but you check also. I mean, if we get yeah. to fly anytime soon. Uh, yes, but um, yeah, bring it to me that day and we can compare it with the forecast for that day and see what. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Preeti now. Yeah, hi, Gurpreet. Hi, so Preeti. My, my question is very basic. Back to the. This thermal, is basic. Stuff. Yeah, thermaling <laughs> again. So, how yeah. do you visualize in your head? Do you keep a tighter turn, flat turns? And I know that's. Thermals are not really one shape and could be like a cylindrical or different shapes. So how do you visualize on a typical day when you go up and pour it better and not? I, I am kid at, kid at heart. I think of all the nice balloons, orange balloons, red balloons, yellow balloons. It, it, it makes it funny. It keeps me happy. I'm in a birthday party. <laughs> so <laughs> what's better model than that? You feel much better anyway. So these nice balloons that 
so how do you code better like how do you sort of i mean you know how to do it and you need to bank it well and all of that and and still there's so much disruption if you get out of it and um, you know so how do you sort of manage um, this question came up other day also with debu and i was thinking how i'm not for it and uh, except for like what debu said you be more aggressive and strong and relaxed with the uh, with the week one and what i have told you that the course shift depending on the wind and the, the kind of heat if heat like sun suddenly gets brighter the they will the core will drift more upwind if partial cloud comes in the core will go a little bit downwind and wind also varies so so you can continuously generally how i teach students my student is one thing i think now we're going towards the physical skills so i'll go a few minutes and then i'll ask you if you understood or not so now think of board as a cross section that we we slice the thermal and what do we see so we should see something like this the core can shift from here these three four places this is the orange ones the blue ones and the turbulent here right what i teach is the, the reversal method it's not my method it's i also came across it and then i realized that good products all do it direction that wherever you enter you you enter here let's say right you can don't need to think too much if your glider wants to turn left let it turn left about 90 degrees right or you can choose a side also because sometimes you hit like absolutely perpendicular that it doesn't want to turn on the other side just most moment it you feel lifty and you know it's big enough it feels big enough or is that kind of day people are already going up nicely then you let yourself turn anything from 70 to 90 degrees to one side and then turn opposite so it's it's all think of it like wing over you hit the lift you do it this way and turn back see this wing over motion lets you attack even a very strong thermal nicely it's natural one inside will always kick you try to kick you out so it's already doing that 90 degree let it happen then use it the energy like a wing over and come back in it's natural it flows you inside the thermal and wherever you came in if you did this or this and then turn your circle you see you automatically around core there's no coring skill required you can hit the core in the first thermal well, first circle itself so this is the easiest way to do it then once we are in the thermal use the weight shift a lot right we anyway will have to use some brake so that will automatically keep us toward close to minimum sinks we don't need to use brakes to stay close to minimum sink just the brake required to uh, turn is enough right so you use as much possible as weight shift and inside brake now weight shift and inside brake are there for tightening the turn or loosening the turn right so what do we use for maneuvering our shape in the thermal the shape of thermal is it the weight shift and the inside break so it doesn't change very often it changes but smoothly slowly what's outer hand doing is staying at the pressure point okay that was another question from uh, nepal that day It came through uh, vishal from the previous lecture is uh, that hands up uh, is not good because you can not connect it to glider whenever i say hands up i don't mean into the slack of course staying connected to glider is essential it's a must if you did as i did with me i always said connect to your glider connect to your glider i don't recommend flying into the slack so out outer hand now your weight shift and the brake going maintaining the turn outer hand is at the pressure point and is kind of relaxed like kind of relaxed that you are playing table tennis good table tennis player would be relaxed you won't be tight if you tight you don't play good so it's at the pressure point ready so what do we use it for for checking the pitch if you play the dives check it pitch is not good good first skill that you need to master in thermal is keeping the pitch in control if your glider stays flat doesn't dive much going back is not a problem right even i first thumbling lesson i give to my students is forget it roll forget it no problem yeah. right glider pitching back no problem forget it only thing i want to see from you is you don't let the glider dive 
right? Can't be simpler than this. Only one thing to worry about now is keep it turning full way chip and get comfortable with the bank, staying in the bank. Don't try to straighten it all the way. Straighten it all the way. Don't go, ooh, ooh, no. Keep it in the bank. This is now our natural state for the next 10, 15 minutes, staying slightly banked. Be happy with it. Right? And then feel it. Feel each circle. So if you felt like this is our circle, I felt good lift here. Don't react at that time. Don't worry. Now mental note, good lift here, not so bad, good one here. Or sink here. So next circle, you, you now you know that this was good lift and previous one, this was not so good lift. So already when I come, go past this, I'm not taking doing anything for this. What I'm doing is avoiding this now. Not so good. So I tighten up here. Right? And loosen up on the other side a little bit further. And try to, so each turn, you keep doing this. Why? Because the cores change their location with respect to the circle also. It's not in the same place. You can understand those balloons will shoot up at different places. Right? They, they have no um, agreement with each other that you are in lead, you will stay in lead. They, they constantly, whichever gets the easier path, shoots up. So those balloons, red balloons in our body are moving in a, in a, in a different way. So you keep feeling which side they are doing better and modify your circle. Modify how with inside break and weight shift and outside hand is reflexively controlling your pitch. Don't think about it too much. We each stage where automatically it controls the pitch automatically. And that's the only thing you initially need to worry about. Okay. So Thank if you have less to worry about, you can think about the thermal and course correction each circle, forget it. You can't even do like one circle, I found the core, now I relax, no, no, no. Minor correction all the time. Feel it, feel it, feel it. And that is the trick. You ask me what's the, uh, what's the trick for good thumbing is feel it. Um, and this get better, you get better at thumbling in the weak conditions actually. And you get more courageous in the, in the strong conditions. And the fear element or the courage element, what you need to understand is you have to check why did I come into this sport? It's an adventure sport, right? Why did I come in? Because I wanted to challenge my fear. Yes. So let's do it. So when you get an opportunity, stay focused. See, joy and motivation are very, very important. Joy is also very important. So you came to fly, right? You came to thermal. You knew it's scary. And you wanted to conquer your fears, right? So don't lose focus of that. So work on your motivation. And like, I generally joke that, you know why I became a good pilot? Because I was having a bad marriage. I didn't want to land because I was have to deal with the same <laughs> I just wanted to stay in the sky longer and longer. So, so whatever, I mean, whatever it takes, you tell yourself how happy you are when you're near. And yes, it comes with the penalty of a little bit fear at the time or a little discomfort. And you work on your joys. You focus on your joys. You tell yourself your joy. Then you'll stay longer and you'll, everybody feels fear. Don't, don't think you're the only one. Everybody feels fear. I think Debu will agree with me. Um, we all get scared sometimes. But then you have to remember, like, if I overcome this, like, and also learn to evaluate danger and fear. Challenge fear, never the danger. If it's dangerous, but if it's just fearsome, no immediate danger to be seen, you challenge it. And you feel more joy after that. So, there's, I hope it answers your question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Gurpreet, we have another question from Alan. Alan, can you hear us? Alan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, hi, Guru. Hi, Alan. How are you? Hi. Fine, thanks. This adiabatic lapse rate, dry adiabatic lapse rate, and uh, saturated. We will come to that. Rate. Okay. We will come, come, come to that. That's the next part. When we discuss uh, the sounding here, then we will discuss. Thank that. you. Thank you so much. Lapse rate. But today I'm not going so much into curves. Huh? I will stay with the concept of uh, lapse rate and inversion and stuff. Uh, the, the exact, like somebody wants to discuss the curve or the charts, let's do that in a private session because that's a little heavy. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, there's a question by Pratik. Pratik, do you hear us? 
Yeah. Uh, hi, Gurpreet. This is Pratik here. So uh, yeah, my question is back to your concept of uh, the bubbles. Uh, one thing I found it a little difficult to understand is why would a strong bubble uh, go more upwind? Can you explain that once again? Because see, uh, let's just, uh, look at this way. If you open the tap, and actually tap is a little bit like the nozzle is not so good. It will have a spray, some bigger spray, some smaller, and the wind is blowing. The biggest drop will fall more vertically, and the smaller drops will get washed by the wind. It's the same invert. It's the same model. Oh, okay, got it. I understand. Thanks. Right. Okay, we have another question from Stanzin. Stanzin, you can go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hello. Yes, sir. My question is regarding the thin air load mustard pressure. So, will there be any variable in thermals forming and strength of the thermals as compared to the plain sea level area? Honestly, at the altitudes you're talking about, I have no idea. Flown up to five thousand seven hundred meters. Uh, yes, in thermal, I didn't feel any major difference. In air, uh, there was no only takeoff and landings are way faster, uh, and the wind picked up very quickly. Otherwise, inside the thermal, mm -hmm. I didn't feel any difference. Theoretically speaking, also your your sink rate is slightly higher and you moving faster, but your glide ratio is the same. Um, I think your banking would be a little more for the same amount of turn automatically, but besides that, nothing else changes. That, that's uh, mm -hmm. as far as I can. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, one more question, sir, please. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. One more question regarding the counting three second three. Uh, like uh, while approaching for the thermal, uh, uh, like. Uh, some guys, like, uh, they are acknowledging that uh, uh, we have to count till three seconds and, and then take the turn either life, left or right. What's the, like, so myth or, like... Uh, if you follow this method this. that I just told you about, then you don't need to count three. You can do this 90 degree okay. turn and turn back. And even if you, when you're turning tight okay. and you can't stay inside the thermal, you can continue to find another one. If you can turn inside it, then it's big enough yeah. to turn it. The, that is the old method, three-second okay. method, and uh, it, it's not so easy. In real, if you look at the competition products, nobody waits three seconds. So what we don't do, I don't like preaching. Okay. Yeah. You try to get okay. familiar with okay. this part, or like, <laughs> let your turn 90 degrees or less than 90, even yeah. 70 degrees is enough, and then reverse your circle. In half a circle, you will know. This is almost the same as going three seconds. You, you turn a little bit this side, like a small rock to one side, drop back. Continue. If you if you can stay in the mm -hmm. lift, then fine. If you drop out, that means thermal was not big enough because you will be uh, concentric with the core anyway when you use this method. Okay, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. The, this method does not come naturally. Practice it because we miss the moment. We generally miss okay. the moment. So without practice, this mm -hmm. will not start working. So, but once you start doing it, it's very easy after that to go. Sure, sir. Lovely. I will do it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, sir. Okay, there's a very futuristic question for you, Gurpreet. This is from Arvind Arun. He wants to know, aren't there any thermal imaging equipments for us, like night vision cameras <laughs> that would make it easy? <laughs> and one you have to understand is that thermals don't go up where they form. They go up from trigger points. And okay, mountain, the trigger points are easy to see, but flatlands, it's not so easy. Uh, so thermal imaging does not give you a clue on where the thermal is. It will give you a clue where the hot earth is. But yeah. then the... Um, air will move from there and trigger from somewhere else. So it doesn't help you. What they have tried to do is uh, there was something based on interference pattern, uh, but it's too bulky an equipment. It's not carryable right? uh, on the on the particular in a paraglider. So it, it, it's not. Second guy, what he did was that um, he plots uh, micro turbulences. Right. So if sun is shining, then it's a micro turbulence which trigger. 
and that's another theory. It's not just the topography, it's the micro turbulence along the topography, which triggers the thermal. Um, and they, that was more like your GPS based map, which will give you more predictable lines. But as far as I know, this has not become commercial yet. He, this was the idea, he was working on it, but it's not commercial yet. It hasn't uh, been, I think, even used in a competition. So. Okay, I think that answers Arvind's question. Uh, we have another question from Vikas. Vikas, you can go ahead. Hi. Uh, Gurpreet, you mentioned uh, that when you are into the core, uh, you keep correcting yourself and just like uh, don't keep uh, uh, doing the 360s. So do you mean to say that when we, uh, when we are doing the 360s, uh, we open and close the turn? Uh, and yeah. The, and yeah, and we open it uh, uh, towards the windward side, like say for half a second. No, 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 no. no? You, it, see, I said when you get in, always like when you let's say I do start doing this circle, and I was in the lip. What I need to do is at some point, yes, go more up in and see where the boundaries. Let's say this is the windward side. I need to see, oh, this is the boundary. So then I know that I am close to because this is not a, if I'm doing circle here, this is not a good place. Okay, so I need to find where the upwind side is. So then I know, okay, this is upwind side. I need to stay slightly this side. But then within the thermal, the core will shift from here to here to here to here. And within this part, it can change. So I keep trying to do circle here, wherever. The is. Hai na? Yeah. Continuously, you go towards a better lift, not necessarily towards upwind every time. The leaning of the thermal and correcting for the wind part, we can do later if we have time, or I can do it separately some other time. Basics, basic, the new students will not be so much interested in that. We will come to that later on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This answers your question. This was a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Got it, got it. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, Gurpreet, I'll ask you another question. Uh, as a beginner, we speak a lot about, uh, or rather we hear the instructor speak about thermal mapping, you know, when we are in that progression stage. So uh, what exactly is this thermal mapping? It's exactly what we talked about, that when you're doing a circle, keep in mind which part of the circle was more lifty, right? Yeah. Don't react at that time, but on the opposite side of the circle, now correct for that. Okay. Get, get me? When I am, let's say I felt best lift here. This was the plus. Yes. Okay. I went through this, nothing to do here. Memorize this part was the lifty part. And then when we are on the op opposite side, then yes. I correct to go slightly longer and try to thermal around it. Okay. All right. So you map in your mind where the best lift is. Draw it in six, seven parts and try to remember which part of the circle was yeah. better lift and then modify the circle a little bit that side and then don't give up then again keep feeling and if you feel some other part then modify to that part excellent yeah anything else uh we don't have any other questions good uh, right. so yeah. we move move towards instability now and also particularly the relationship between instability and turbulence. The least side turbulence. So now we described the thermal going up. And we have some picture of it. But this is one partner in the dance. What's the other partner is the sounding air. What's the air around this air? What is this air doing? Because this is what is pushing it up. The force is coming from this air, wanting to take this space and push the warm air up. Right? So there comes something, and then you can see the same amount of sun, similar days, in within the week, let's say, similar clouds, one day with same amount of sun, weather didn't change much, the thermals are good, and the other days they're not good. Right? So what changes is how the temperature is falling in the atmosphere the, that day, the lapse rate. So what is lapse rate is simple. It's the fall, rate of fall of temperature along the height. 
So say, think of it as atmosphere only, but let's say we put some scale. This is altitude scale and this is temperature scale. This is our temperature and this is altitude. This is your sky only. So as you go higher, it gets colder. Right? So if we were here, let's say this was temperature. We go 100 meters up. It should be about the theoretical lapse rate is 0.9 degrees for every 100 meters. So it should be about 0.9 degrees or close to one degree colder yes. and colder and colder. So temperature gets, as you go away, temperature gets something like this. Okay. This is theoretical lapse rate. Now, things vary from the lapse rate. Why? Because air is not one standard, uh, same, um, same amount of humidity, same amount of uh, particles in it. There's different nature to air at different altitude. And uh, then there are things like immersion also. So actual lapse rate kind of varies. You will see something like well, in the morning, you see a ground immersion. What's immersion? This is normal lapse rate. So what's normal lapse rate doing? It's sloping this way. It's cooling as it goes up. If it does the other thing, like it warms up, then it's inversion. So morning ground is cold, you go a few meters higher, the warm air warms up, but then it starts forming. And you can do something like this. And generally clouds is forming, then it stays like this, and it is generally a cloud here. Right. So now this was theoretical. We call it TLR. Don't confuse, even if you understand this, fine. Just giving them names. And this is observed, actual. Actual is ELR. And somebody asked about uh, dry and saturated. So ELR is divided in two parts. Below the cloud base is dry adiabatic lapse rate. Don't worry. This part we know, lapse rate. The lapse, the, how the temperature lapse or falls with the altitude. Dry means air is not saturated. It doesn't mean it's dry. It can have humidity, but it's not saturated. There are no clouds in it. Okay. So, and adiabatic means we are not considering loss of, loss of temperature to surrounding. But that's, forget about that. That's theoretical part. Dry means below the cloud uh, base level and uh, saturated is above the cloud base level. So this part inside the cloud is SALR. Saturated adiabatic lapse rate. Okay, so now we understand what the lapse rate is, but how does it affect the thermal? So this is how our temperature is falling in the atmosphere. So what is thermal? Thermal would be some, this is the normal temperature of the, ground, uh, of the air. So thermal is some packet of air which has gotten a little bit warmer. Right? As it goes up, it loses temperature more parallel to the theoretical lapse rate. Right? And it can either meet the, uh, the environmental lapse rate somewhere. That means there will be no cloud. If it's below that, let's say this is viewpoint. Dew point is where the cloud, the temperature at which the, the clouds will form. So if this curve for the thermal meets the environmental lapse, the temperature of the thermal, see thermal, because it's warmer, will lose temperature faster than the surrounding air. Because there will be some losses. This is not adiabatic, this will have some losses. Right? And atmosphere, because it's uniform, Wait twice, will not be losing to the surrounding air. Only thermal will be losing. So if you take a hot body and less hot body, soon the temperature would be same because the hotter body will lose temperature faster. Right? So if it meets below the cloud, uh, the dew point, then there will be a blue day. And if it meets above the dew point, actually could never meet that. It, it doesn't meet here. Let's say it goes up. And this dew point, then it will warm up. Why would the air warm up inside the clouds? Because energy is released. When yeah. you evaporate water, energy is absorbed. When the water recondenses into droplets, energy is released. Yeah. 
So left straight. So this is basically. So now you can see, bigger the gap. If the if some days the lap straight is more vertical. I'll draw a straight line now, not curve. Uh, if it's more vertical, it's likely to meet the uh, the the lap straight of the thermal at a lower altitude, right? If the lap straight is more leaning, then they will not meet. That means thermal will go all the way to cloud base. So if the ELR is more vertical, that is a stable day. Yes. What does it mean practically? That there won't be much temperature difference between bead and billing. If billing is feels colder that day, then normally then it's unstable day. If it feels almost as warm as bead, then it's a stable day. Right? So you can go by feeling also. You're not talking pure mathematics. You can feel it also. If temperature is cooling rapidly with altitude, then it's an unstable day. Thermals will go higher and faster because there's more energy variable. The temperature difference at all, all altitude is actually increasing in some cases, right? So thermal can get stronger. Of course, energy goes in broadening also. So as thermal grows up, it, it broadens. So it's it's so whenever a river broadens, what happens? The flow slows down. So generally, thermals slow down as they reach the cloud base or the top. But if there's a cloud, then the cloud suck makes it faster close to the base. So if you're going up toward the cloud base and lift is getting faster, then there's definitely cloud suck. Otherwise, as you go higher, the thermal should ease up a bit. So that's uh, what the environmental effect, the lap state. So now you understand with respect to mathematics, the curve, and the stability, the general stability, is uh, when the lap straight is falling faster, is the leaning of the curve is more than stronger thermals. If the curve, the environmental lap straight is vertical, then weaker thermals and lower cloud based or lower ceiling. If it's a blue day, so uh, make sense. I will invite question here, and then we go to the effect it has on okay we have uh, one more question from daksh daksh are you online daksh, daksh doesn't have a speaker uh, sorry my okay i'll uh, ask the question thus daksh has a question which source do you use to check soundings and uh, do you use qt's and how reliable do you find it for india uh, there is no accurate soundings available for India. We use uh, data from GFC, which is the NOAA data, and it's all remote sensed. And uh, sounding is something which is not so good when it is remote, remote sensed. They use an um, uh, inertial model. They, they um, radar ping the particles uh, and try to calculate from there and it's not very accurate. So uh, for India, soundings generally are not so accurate, but what I use is from NOAA. I go directly to NOAA site and download from there. The same data that's available through GFC. And that was it, what was it, full question? The source. Yeah, I think that answers it more or less. Yeah, he says, thank you. All right. Yeah, he says uh, he spoke about the reliability and the source that he used to check soundings. So you said uh, yeah. no. Yeah. Soundings, yeah. Uh, I only use soundings when it's competition and I'm, I'm to give weather briefing. So, or if I have serious doubts about inversions. Uh, even uh, the Jigish, uh, the, the model he was running, he was giving, uh, but it was from the same. It was also from GFC only. The data he was... Uh, using for that model so um all right i so guess that's uh, that does move forward? yeah all right yes now uh, the point i want to make now is relationship we understand now the thermals would be faster if it's unstable day and uh, thermals would not be so good if it's a stable day 
And what is unstable and stable is lapse rate. If it's more lapse, the temperature is getting colder, uh, more than normal with altitude, then it's unstable. The thermals would be good. If, if it's staying warm with all, uh, the normal at the altitude, then it's not about the day, the, the difference. Okay, the, the ground to take off to higher up, the, what is the uh, temperature difference happening? Sometimes it's a warm day, uh, like late spring, uh, we are sweating on the landing, but we are freezing at 3000 already. So that's a fast lapse rate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just about just the feel, it's the difference of with the altitude. So that's something you have to make. Other thing I've noticed is, uh, particularly with me, very relevant in uh, with my students in, in the, uh, flying around building is, there are more reserve deployments on a stable day. Less on unstable days, right? One easy explanation that came to my mind was that people are scratching more on unstable mm -hmm. days. Some of them are not so good. And, uh, but then I saw that there's enough space actually. It's not because of crowding or scratching. Accidents are happening. They're just reserve deployments. Now what happens in B is, this is a statement I heard from a Russian group. He said, there are no lease site in B. You can go anywhere you want. <laughs> now, in some days, I realized that it holds true. Like we mostly go, uh, on, on the takeoff, everybody's careful. They don't go to east side. But you go to the first range, the plus one, what we call it. You go to plus one and people are flying on both sides of it. Uh, they don't really care so much about it. And um, so what's happening? Why, why is it like this? Now, let's say my knuckle is the Dhaladha range, okay? And we have these ridges, the takeoff ridge, plus one, whatever. These are the ridges coming out from Dhaladha. Wind is coming from west, so it comes at an angle. And these are actually not pointed south, they are southwest. And as the wind meets them, the shape of the mountain will turn it towards the valley. So it's filling up this valley, okay? Now, if it's unstable day, that means air will find it easy to rise up. Okay? And as it rises up and fills up this place, it will fill up the lee side of the ridges more easily. So it, it, there won't be enough space because of this filling effect. It's kind of like, like blowing up from here, filling up where the rotor would have formed. So they're less, yeah. but give a stable day, the air is not finding it so easy to rise. It's getting pressed down and spilling over, spilling over like this, right? It's, it's heavy and you will have a more stronger rotor. So where you, you just add a stronger uh, stable day and a little bit stronger wind and we have clear rotors where there were no rotors on an unstable day. So when actually it's people are getting good heights, having good flights, they fly everywhere, it's not, but you add, so now you understand the rotors would be stronger on a stable day because air is getting pressed up, down on the surface, not finding so easy, it's not filling up. You can under, also understand the lee side thermals is if sun is on this side, wind is coming from this side, wind is anywhere filling it. You will have, sun is shining, you'll have some thermals going up, right? If it's unstable day, they will even push through the rotor easily. But if it's a stable day, then rotor would be strong. So um, uh, that's the relationship with uh, turbulence. And also, I think uh, that day somebody was asking where to go for lee side thermal. So if this is rich, wind is coming from this side, you have a rotor higher up, you're coming from here, let's say, and you realize you're not going to cross over, you have to take lee side. Sun is, let's say, somewhere here. Then um, you try to go below it. Right, and find a trigger point, come up with the thermal, and realize when this you're in this part, you need to be pouring very tightly and bank nicely to go through safely. This is where the danger would be, and lower down it will be fine. So, uh, this is also uh, with the instability that if it would be a more stable day, then this will get dangerous. You can't go, but if it's an unstable day, you can do it, and we do it actually, and we do it pretty often without thinking about it. Okay, that was my question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Badri has a question, I presume. Badri? No, no, not really, not now. I mean, it was long back, but uh, oh, right. Sorry. No. Yeah. Okay. It was answered, Badri, or you can still ask it. 
question. Yeah, yeah, it is answered. Fine. Okay. So, um, I mean, this is as far as I want to go with this session. So, questions or suggestions for next time, if any. Pilots, please open up. Either they stood, understood everything or they didn't. The possibility is high. <laughs> and also, I can, uh, if uh, somebody wants me to repeat something in Hindi or answer a question in Hindi, I can do that. Hey, uh, I have a question, Gurpreet. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure whether you will cover it today or later, but let me just okay. put the question. Uh, okay. How does the you know, high winds at higher altitudes, cirrus, often, when, whenever I see the lines in beer, I usually know and it, it's observed that there's a bit turbulence on that day. Can you explain with the two models that we have discussed so far, the sticky model and the, the surrounding pressure, uh, how does this actually happen? Uh, generally, I, generally, if it's a um, uh, zero, straight, uh, uh, zero uh, status, that means uh, inversion at high altitude, above us generally, but should not produce turbulence. Was it cirrus or uh, was it uh, lenticular cloud or something forming, like north winds higher up? Uh, way high up, a lines of cloud, you know, you can see going. So maybe yeah, you're right. I may not have read it right. Uh, but typically I have seen a way high up when we see some of the lines, curving mm -hmm. lines a bit. In beer, in beer, if we see uh, lenticular, it's generally very high, like 10, 12,000 meter high. It doesn't affect us, but it only forms with north wind. See, mountain is on the north side. If we have wave forming, then the wind would be coming from north at that altitude, right? And uh, we are in a big enough pocket because mountains behind are 5,000, 5,500 meters. So we are in a pocket and we still fly. But yes, because of that influence, it will be turbulent. So if it's north winds higher up, it would be turbulent. That's what okay. I've seen and not so much relationship with. If you look at the even windy and see uh, altitude winds, and if they were north winds, we will have turbulence. Uh, though not directly apparent, two things would be uh, happening that day. One, there would be uh, uh, turbulent, and it will not. It will be sinky around the tower. No, more sinky okay. than normal. It will be fine close to the mountain, but if you go towards tower, we don't get the glide ratio we expected to that. So it's a sinky out, like three, four kilometers out. It's the wave is coming in the down phase, but close to mountain, we, and we generally stay close to mountain. So a lot of people don't even realize that there's north wind and the wave forming okay. up there. And we fly in a pocket, but because mountain is so big, the pocket is big enough. So uh, a secondary question, uh, can I go for one more? Yeah, 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 go ahead, Roy. Okay. Uh, it's always been challenging to judge. I mean, typically, you know, beer, often we have early development uh, by 12 o'clock sometimes, by 2 o'clock. Uh, and then, then we start thinking whether we should push further or turn back. There are days when I have left a perfectly good day. It never turned too much over development. There were, there were this big cloud. They started getting tall. They started covering the back ridges. But by the time I landed, things started settling down as well. On uh, other day, I have caught myself in a bit of a fix when you know things really got stronger. So I just found myself some out landing and landed safely. But can can you help us, you know, with your knowledge, understanding, and experience uh, um, to be safe? Ahead. The <laughs> simplest answer to this is that you can't win them all. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I know, I know. I mean, we're just greedy pilots who come from the planes and we yeah. want to fly every day. That's our problem. See, Rohit, it's, it's not only that. You, uh, I've seen that uh, if you are a very prudent flyer, then you miss out on some good days, uh, but you're safe. And uh, then you see other pilots who are taking chances have a good day and they kind of rub it in your face saying, that was fine, why did you chicken out? There is chickening out and there is just prudence and uh, going longer without injuries and the reserve deployments you have to find the right balance there or um, yeah, if it was like a weak front passing through that can other explanation can be so you need to pay attention to the forecast and if there was a front okay. passing through you still think it's flyable go on with it but you also know this will if it's going maximum is it's not raining and this is the max and you know after like 
two o'clock, it's mm -hmm. front has passed already. Then you you know for sure that if the development is not dangerous by two o'clock, it's not going to uh, thunderstorm at three because the forecast says it's going to pass. Because of course you keep an eye, but the, the, the forecast gives you some clue if you are clued in actually. All right. So you have to do both. It's like same, uh, I generally consider it good with the forecast, but even I will not. Uh, go only by forecast. I'm doing uh, my evaluation as I fly also, yeah. but uh, generally taking educated guess based on what the forecast said. Thanks, thank you, Rafiq. All right. Rafiq, you have a question from Amit. <coughs> Amit, you're up. Amit, can you hear us? Oh, uh, hey, KK. Hi, Gurpreet. How are you doing? Hi, Amit. So, Gurpreet, I, I asked this question to Debu in his session too, and um, uh, I think I have the same question right now. Um, how, in your experience, uh, you know, what, what are the good things which work to identify convergence uh, lift lines while flying, right? And uh, one of the things which we kind of discussed in the previous session was that, hey, if you have a bunch of clouds forming in a place where they usually don't form, that's a good hint. But uh, just wanted to understand more on what could be the other hints uh, which we could leverage to understand and, you know, go and find uh, these convergence lines. Okay, Amit. Um, one, uh, Debu answered this question, I think, pretty well the other day. It's, uh, you have to look for clues. And of course, one of the clues, I mean, is, he answered it perfectly, actually, with the cloud is the biggest clue. And uh, topography, you look at the shape of valleys. Convergence generally form where you have converging airflows. So you have to look at the sources like um, coastal winds and the uh, prevailing wind, like particularly all along Western coast, it's a, it's a conflict. You have westerly coastal wind and easterly prevailing wind. It starts closer to the coast and comes a little bit this way. Someday it comes a little further in, like the day you guys couldn't land in the competition. And then some days it stays closer to the coast. So there's a daily variation and it, some days a little bit more, some days you can, you can, you have to, and it's more about feeling, watching for signs uh, and having some um, confidence in, in uh, it also. Other, uh, if you go to mountains, see Billing doesn't have much convergence zone. As such, there is one convergence zone on the side of Jagindanagar. When you go towards 360, there's one part which is only turbulent also. And I told the convergence are at the lower level, they are conflicting, and the higher level, they converge and go up. So, slightly after Jagindanagar, before 360, there is a kind of a division. There's a high point, the valley lowers towards Mandi and valley lowers towards Jagindanagar also. And there is from Bilaspur side, there is some airflow coming, and from Kangra side, there's airflow coming. We've never been able to use it properly. I've tried a few times, I've been partly, it's just a lot of turbulence there, and not so much of gaining height, because it's, it's like this, it's not converging like this, it's mm -hmm. going in, and towards the mountain. And the mountain is a little lower there, so it's not doing anything fruitful there. Except that, so you look at the topography, you look at the sources of wind, particularly uh, valley system that will bring converging air force and um, coastal wind, prevailing wind. So these kind of things. And then you look at the clues, like you look for lift. There's no way to see lift, same. there's no way to lift, uh, see uh, convergence also. You look for clues. And uh, if you're very sure about it, like one of the proud moments in my competition was winning a task in the pre-world championship in Bulgaria by 15 minutes. And um, that was on convergence. And strangely enough, that day in briefing, I think Vijay, if Vijay's on, Vijay was there. Um, in briefing, I mentioned that there's a convergence. This is too easy a task. And the meet director, Nikki, he, um, he turned around and he told everybody, Gurpreet thinks there's a, uh, a convergence and we should make the task longer or different and anybody wants to do that and nobody did. And mm -hmm. I won that task. So sometimes we just keep the, and I, I, I knew it from the shape and from experience of flying there both. Um, and and uh, the day, because there was some predicted um, north flow and there's a gap in the mountain that brings in north flow. 
and we already in the valley, we already have two flows. So there was three flows coming in, converging at that point, and I knew this will create a convergence there. So um, there was no cloud that day. It was purely by uh, concept and the wind, uh, and keeping the shape of the valleys in my head very clearly, and where the air flows come from in, in the different places. So it's only those, there's no way to mark it directly, and it changes. If one of the airflow is, is, is faster or stronger and in volume, it will push the convergence to other side. Hmm. So it, it changes. And if they're too sharp and narrow, they will just produce turbulence. It has to be a broad enough uh, air mass uh, involvement that produces convergence. If it's narrow valleys, they just produce turbulence because like sharp jets that will not produce convergence, you need a broad enough thing to hit each other and then go up. So you need a broader air mass. So shape of valley, clouds, and then trusting it and experimenting with it and just go fly it. If you, if you predict it, then you go fly it. And you'll know. That's the only way. Thanks, Kurpreet. Okay, we have lots of questions coming up. We have a question from Rohan Hassani. Rohan? Uh, yes, uh, I was asking is uh, while we are traveling in a thermal, uh, sorry, while we are transiting from one place to another, so con let's consider that if you are traveling from one place to another, so it is very difficult to uh, look like what will be the situation ahead because uh, there are different conditions in all uh, different parts. So how do you get a gist of it? Like uh, what is going on over there? Um, generally, we, yeah, the first uh, thermal lecture we do, I think we, uh, I gave, I don't know about others, but generally I think most instructors do the same. The five things you keep in, bear in mind, six things actually, uh, sun and wind, where they are, that will decide um, the, where the thermal would be, uh, the equal priority to sun and wind, then there is topography and cloud. So topography is shape which will direct the airflow and where the uh, hot air will go and then where it will trigger from. So that is also topography. And that is the beginning of the thermal and cloud marks that, if there is cloud that marks the top of the thermal. So, and third is the clues, the, the birds, the other pilots, stuff like that. So these are the five things that you keep in mind. Sun, wind, cloud, topography. If you're low, you pay more attention to topography. When you're high, you pay more attention to the clouds. Um, so these are the basic stuff and uh, there's more because each of them, like these five things are, when we do uh, teaching, it's full chapter by itself. Like sun angle, as the, during the sun, the sun changes, it will change where the thermal would be, or at least the source of thermal would be the hot air. And then um, the topography remains same, but as you go, you have to elevate the next valley and the next valley and the next valley or the next ridge line. You look for a trigger point, try to reach the trigger point that you can arrive over. Right, always be on the ridge lines, not on the in the along the slopes. Try to uh, come over the ridge line. Keep a backup, uh, lower trigger points in hand. If you don't find something there, go for the lower one. Um, and of course, you watch, you watch, smell, listen, and try to everything. You watch for trees, uh, leaves of the tree, good indication. You. Even sounds carry better in thermals when you have upcurrents. You, you can. I one day um, post monsoon, I, I went into thermals and there was so much noise of the crickets, and I realized that this was very very apparent that day where the thermals were. That I deliberately switched off my uh, radio and flew only with the sound of crickets, and it was one of the most uh, uh, natural flying experience in my life. I mean, at that day I felt really connected with <laughs> nature because just the sound of like tree, 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 and it's clear. I could just thumb up. It didn't need a behavior. And when they it went like subdued, I knew there's nothing. And then again, it went a little louder in the noise. And it was very, very uh, uh, clear that day. There was post monsoon and there were a lot of crickets in the forest. So observant, and you'll be more observant when you're more relaxed. So the the, um, the thing we talked about, like uh, maintaining pitch and keeping your glider nice and easily relaxed, banked in the thermal, that will make you think and uh, feel more. If you focus on the physical skills of thermaling, it has become hasn't become an instinct or a reflex yet. Then you can't think of the other things. So very important again to practice. 
reach that level where you are not really thinking about tumbling and you're thinking about where to go and what to see around. So you, you notice things better. But keep your senses alive. Throw the fear out. Fear stops our senses. So uh, that's the only yeah. solution. Yeah, perfect. Right. Ajay, do you, Rupi, do you need a break? You haven't had a sip no, of water. Okay. I, I have a bottle of water. Excellent. <laughs> okay, we have Sajid on next. Sajid, go ahead. Yeah. GD, uh, we've been doing, I've been doing a lot of uh, study on uh, the skewity uh, uh, prediction. And uh, there are, uh, I usually go to the NARL uh, uh, website and pick that up from uh, there. It, it gives everything for, for India, yeah. including NARL Buna India. Is, is a NOAA website only. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you want, so then I think we're looking at the same thing because there are various QTs uh, that are given. The one that we look at is at a yeah. particular thing, the ELR uh, changes as yeah. per the, and the, and the temperature time uh, yeah. that's posted. Now, my uh, question is two part. One is, uh, when we fly at calm shed, we are not really looking for more than a bar of, uh, you know, 800, 700 bar. That's also too much. So, so the, the difference is very less uh, for the vertical uh, view of the temperature. That is yeah. one. Uh, and the more you study, the more every time you learn a little bit more about skewity because it's pretty complicated. But uh, today, uh, recently, we have been doing some study and we found out how to predict the uh, inversion. But in your experience, uh, how much does this NARL really work uh, when we have windy and when we have uh, XE uh, skies? So and how predictable is it when you read it before you go to fly? Where they have reliable data now, it's many like uh, XE skies, particularly, it's using the global for the GFS from NARL or uh, NOAA, um, and it's also using local data, like in Europe, it uses local, it gets sounding from the airports. Uh, the, our airports, you know better, they have, have sounding, they have med stations, but that those med stations are not collaborating very well with the um, IMD. That data is not public. I found some data, but then when I go there, it's not accurate. The, I mean, the, uh, the IMD website shows um, security available from Dharamshala. But uh, it looks hooked up. It doesn't relate to uh, what's happening there. Exactly, that's so my point. So when we look at a SQT for Pune, that includes Pune, Kamshed, Lonavla. So yeah. we are thinking that's very specific for our uh, Tower Hill website, uh, site, but it's not really. It's it's a very large area. So how reliable yeah. would that be in your experience? It's not reliable enough to predict inversions. Generally, I have a tougher time predicting inversions. Um, I'm looking at other stuff <laughs> uh, like uh, differences in observed and uh, met and then I predict like if it says uh, it should be cloudy by the scrutiny but it's not then I know there's a question yeah. <laughs> that's happened so many times if, if, uh, if it rained uh, and uh, cleared up and it's absolutely blue sky and that's the day kind of I laugh at people people call up like are you going it's a beautiful day no, it's not beautiful. There's so much humidity around, and if there's not going to be any cloud as per the forecast, then there is something keeping things down. So it's not going to be a good day. So I look for those kind of clues. And uh, this is the thing with forecasting. People like uh, earlier, I did it also. I did one lecture where people expected me to give them some epiphany uh, that uh, will enable. But forecasting is about learning small models and keeping a lot of factors, you need a broader mind, you need a lot of factors in your mind right. to correlate and analyze why this, why that, and a lot of why is going on that, but the, the, the soundings available for India are not good, and if you find right. a good data, then please share with me. Right. Because I've been a little lazy, I haven't been doing any current research, actually. Right. Um, so no, what, what, find... what, what we are finding out is that uh, sometimes windy doesn't work, XC, XC sky really uh, sometimes point forecast works, but not really to the point where we think that okay, we can go today's a good day. But what we see in beer is people like yourself, Debu, and all the uh, uh, experienced pilots over there. You guys seem to know a particular good day because when you fly and you do distances, <laughs> we know that okay, today is going to be a good day. So you are our XC sky for us. But how does that work? We, we thought you were looking at it, but I guess we, we both no, are, no, we all no, are on no, the no, same no, boat. No, no. 
it's really not because of any i don't have any hidden secret source of uh, weather data whatever i have i have always shared i even when i was running the, the group uh, any new data or website i find or some hidden feature of i am the site i have always shared right it's not that i'm i'm, I'm, so no, I'm, I'm not i'm not saying uh, you're hiding it what no, i'm I saying mean, is I, you know i'm trying to figure out what because we have been doing this at uh, at uh, rohit and i have been doing this very regularly and we have been sharing our data with each other he does a lot of xc uh, skies i do a lot of uh, narl but you know it's a hit and a miss it's it's never reliable so i understand i think probably the data is not right data is not, if you go purely by my, you need to uh, observe and experience uh, add the experiences and try to figure out why why okay. no cloud why clouds what's happening where was the inversion yesterday what happened when it go higher so you take the history also and predict so that's what i'm doing I'm not just going by the forecast only i'm taking the yesterday's history also right next day's forecast also if it's going was inversion blue day and now is showing after 2 o'clock today cloud so i know inversion is breaking right. so that means if 2 it's breaking or at 1:30 is breaking just 12:30 onward it will be very strong because that will be the first flush of the right so it's like that kind of forecast so it's also the history and yeah. other factors so it's just wider vision nothing nothing i think else. once we crack this will start not even that. not even deeper i think just wider yeah you think keeping more factors in mind that that's all just cool. a broader i'll i'll share what we do and maybe we'll have a discussion offline and yeah, see if, if you are here in bead and you want to, in the morning to talk about the forecast how what i think and how i came to that conclusion ah, very welcome awesome. call, awesome. call me at 7:30 nice. from jelly up and cool that's yeah. awesome thank you very much okay. i will start as you are up next wiz um hi good preet hi wiz hi hi uh, that was that was amazing because uh, you know all these years you know of flying and what i've experienced and uh, you know when you explain it it all kind of uh, falls in place so uh, so i have some some questions uh, i mean i can do one or a couple of them so uh, first one is uh, in beer uh, you know a lot of times uh, you know when you are returning from dharamshala um uh, normally you know after the big phase or sometimes even before the big phase uh, you know i always try and look for these lines uh, lines of lift and uh, so you know sometimes the the line you know you have a lifty line which kind of connects the first knuckle or uh, you know further back depending on the day so uh, so i've never been able to uh, like what actually causes these lines i've experienced them but i don't know what uh... it's change in the the stickiness mostly if it's just talking about one or two days difference it's mostly the change in the uh, cohesive forces yeah no no my my question is that uh, what what causes the lines to form Oh, <laughs> it's a, a good question, but really uh, difficult to answer. Many things. We saw one is the topography, geography, and the nature of air. I think we can all read that. I will skip that right. part. Uh, right. Besides that, uh, there was a very interesting discussion we had uh, with um, the author of Understanding the Sky, like Understanding Flying Weather. Dennis Pagan okay. and uh, Nikolai from uh, Sky Nomad. Nikolai is also a very, very uh, good person to talk to about weather. Um, and Dennis Pagan said that atmosphere has waves all the time. Okay. Right. It's not waves good enough to produce wave lift, but it has waviness right. all the time. So every crust is better thermal. Every sink is worse thermal. So. the hexagon theory he discredits actually in his book he said i don't write about this yet because it's only hypothesis not a rule but he said it's more about these waves right and uh, uh, wherever there's a apex in the waviness of the atmosphere, upper atmosphere wings there is better thermals and wherever there is a, a dip that is the 
less better thermal. So that is a major factor, but very hard to predict, except feel it. And then when you find a line, believe it that this is more lifty line and then try to find thermals uh, or the triggers, other factors in the same line or close to it. And try to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. If it's a if it's a task, then try to choose a line which kind of conforms to both where you want to go as well as the line that you found. You might even go slightly off course and then come back in. Right. Right. So, uh, so, so your uh, see lifty lines, yeah, that means uh, lines where you consistently get better thermals. But uh, yeah. what I'm talking about is sometimes you don't have to thermal. You know, once you get into it's it's almost like a stream. That uh, you know, yeah, you're just staying, you're not thermaling, and you're just you know, uh, kind of riding. Like you said, it's a wave movement. So on the crest, uh, you're higher, and then in the valleys, uh, you know, no, no, it's, you're just. It's not not like a crest on the mountain and like this. There's, it's an upper atmosphere. Let's say things above twelve thousand meters, but right. it creates a, a low pressure and or let's say ascending. Uh, air mass right. and descending air mass, so, and very high, low. Like uh, the influence, vertical influence would be few meters per uh, per hour. Okay. Right, but in a bigger scale, that's a lot of energy. It's not like a thermal. Thermal can easily push through it, but then right. it'll be discouraged. Right. So right. when we have absolutely no need to thermal, that is just a mixture of a good line with the waviness. Right. Uh, and it's a whole huge way, so it can be whole corridor. It, it does it in corridor and parallel corridor and parallel corridor, like they, they generally parallel to each other. And um, according to the shape of mountain, then it's like it's not like a exact like this. It could be a little higher wave here, a little lower wave here. So it's like they they, they form a hexagonal pattern according so, later on. So but, depending uh, on on yeah. Oh yeah. So if depending you on the many, altitude also. Yeah, depending on the altitude. So now, if you have an unstable day and the good part of the line, then it, air is so risy that you don't need to thermal much. It becomes a corridor. Right. And you see clouds also form very nicely, yeah. very strongly in that corridor. Right. Uh, so you just push on it. Just that overall vertical airflow averages to plus more than plus one, then you don't need to thermal. You continue going there. Okay. So does so that it, not, it, it, it not only depends on um, in plan uh, where you are, it also depends on uh, in altitude yeah. where you are to, to, to latch on to that particular kind of stream. Yeah, and, and what you can't uh, see and, 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 yeah, what yeah. you can't see is the wave itself. So you feel which part and it doesn't uh, yeah. sometimes uh, it doesn't exactly conform with the mountain line also. Maybe the wave yeah. was slightly so, outside on the Dharamshala side and the corner around the Face, it came very close to the mountain and then it jumped back, right? right. Because right. the bigger mountain, so it already dissipated because the mountains towards Bundy are lower and does not forming the wave in the same way. So it can it can do that according to the obstruction, it can change the shape of the wave, uh, even in upper atmosphere. And also, weather patterns create their own wave. So, when cloud gets big enough, it modifies the wave itself. Yeah, I, I kind of experienced this in my uh, last flight. Uh, I did my uh, long flight uh, where, uh, you know, while going towards uh, Dharamshala, you know, I managed to be on the upper ridge uh, yeah. and it was working very well. But uh, uh, that also caused a lot of uh, clouds forming on the ridge, you know, and, and it sort of uh, started forming outwards, almost like a long... Uh, uh, you know, hot dog over over the main yeah. ridge, and uh, the, this line of lift was just outside that cloud line uh, towards the yeah. valley. And uh, uh, I saw some birds, and I knew it was there. And I somehow, it was the first time I managed to get to it, and uh, then it was just uh, just just straight, just just trying to find that line and just gliding, and actually soaring. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think you, I, you, I still you, haven't figured out how how it uh, how it must have formed. That's that's the part uh, I don't get. Now, now you understand better. Is the question answered? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That it's. Uh, uh, um, the other, uh, I don't know. Do we still have time, KK? Uh, lots yeah, of yeah we have time. Uh, okay. No, we just have one more guy after you. 
Amit? Uh, do you mind uh, one more question, yeah. Gurpreet? Yeah. No, no, carry on. Okay, so this is... Um, so a lot of times, I mean, we discussed a little earlier about, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you can't get all the good days. or uh, so, so, obviously, for in spring conditions, you know, when we do these uh, long flights, which are almost uh, mm-hmm. beginning of April, end of March, beginning of April. And, uh, uh, you know, in beer at that time, you have overdevelopment, but they are... Uh, they're more localized. So you, you will either have, you know, something going up at Dharamshala, but the rest of the range is flyable, or you have something over big face, but everything else is fine. So yeah. on, on, on on days like that, uh, I tend to uh, keep flying, you know, so, so, so if I've passed uh, the point at, uh, uh, at Beer, then I will just keep flying. And uh, I know that I have to come back. So I leave it for, for the point where I need to turn around at Monday and uh, you know, then take a call, you know, whether it's still looking. So is this, is this uh, I mean, is this dangerous? Could, could this have uh, probable? Uh... It's, uh, it's totally doable with what you're doing is, but I was just thinking the, the consequence of saying so in front of the whole right. group with different, different right. skill levels here. Yeah? Um, right. The few things before you attempt this, the few things you need to understand. One is very clear picture. The pilot should have. I'm not saying you have or not. The pilot should have very clear picture of uh, cumulus, how it forms, how it becomes the supercell, which way it doesn't move. Don't leave the Meghdoot image. It forms towards one side, and two cells can merge with each other. That's how we had the right. incident in Australia at that time. Um, but um, <clears throat> So that's one. Second is that if it's having any kind of rainfall in it, even if it's away from it, it can produce very strong gust along right. the surface, right? Third thing that you need to still okay. be understand is fawn winds. So I remember one day when right. you were local flying and uh, yes. I predicted you were in trouble because there was fawn uh, uh, wind spilling over uh, the pass uh, near the big place. So uh, if you were, understand... Uh, things to this level, you can fly the localized uh, big cumulus forming, uh, you can fly around them. These three pictures should be very clear. And necessary skills, the physical skills of handling the glider, if it gets a little rough. Right. So if you are at that level, you can fly around big clouds. No issues. Don't try to fly okay. through them. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> That's for the small, uh, fluffy ones that... Uh... Uh, no, even even is. big one, even the one that. But if it's going to thunder and lightning, then then avoid it okay. because that can create some. It can create forty kilometer winds, sixty kilometer away. So you can't run on a paraglider that far. So right. it's, if it goes to that stage, then then definitely avoid it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. My players. And nice to see that uh, the the models are improving. Uh, and the people who already know this stuff, but if the if the visualization is improving, then I will consider this. I will feel happy and consider this successful a lecture. All right. Fantastic. Gurpreet, we have take, Amit next up. Amit. Okay, I will just take one or two more because I'm expecting a guest. I just saw a message, so just one, two more. Okay, uh, we Amit, have uh, one question from Amit and one from Vivek, and then we'll wrap it up. Or yeah. Would, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Amit. All right. Yeah, uh, hey, good Pete again. So this question is from the Wagaman boys. Uh, Vinny okay. and others are asking it. And uh, again, you know, Wagaman, West Facing Ridge, 900 meter height, so on and so forth. Now, uh, convergence is a phenomenon which happens very regularly in Wagaman. And uh, we've been flying convergence there. And you really, like, when, when convergence happens, you can essentially fly anywhere, right? Uh, around the ridge, in the valley, so on and so forth. Um Weather patterns have changed over the past five years and what they are finding recently, uh, and this is the recent past, um, I'm assuming this is the past year, year and a half, uh, when they increasingly see that as they come for landing, a top landing on the meadow, uh, they experience a massive sink just before landing, about 20, 30 feet above uh, the meadow. And this has been happening very regularly, and they are not able to understand why. 
so their question was uh, could it be related to something on convergence or it is it some something else because this didn't happen earlier and this is a phenomena which has started happening very regularly now okay the days it happened uh, it was still windy on the takeoff from the west side the wind was from west and still windy um i don't have the answer to that question if it was still windy then it doesn't have anything to do with convergence they are just i, I answered this other day when you asked ajay i answered in a text saying that you just in, in a rotor on the takeoff make your landings a little bit further back and you should be fine or closer to the front also if there is space so just move a little bit either closer to the lip or safely more safer would be a little bit more back and you will not have a sinky landings and i think this is the probable cause rather than any higher uh, issues like convergence convergence close to ground does nothing a little bit more turbulent it's not sinky there's no way for wind to go down there uh, it right. just produces conflict and up it doesn't produce any down as such rotor produces down so uh, thanks uh, good yeah. no this this is a good answer this helps uh, yeah. vinil if you are online and if you have the answer to gurpreet's question on windy and how windy it was please answer that i guess he is yeah not, yeah uh, yeah i'm on yeah, amit i'm going to put this last hey, question uh, they can call me also directly you can do a video call and um, discuss if if they no finding not finding zoom easier they can whatsapp call me or something we can do a video with them separately class yeah, odi fantastic gurpreet sounds good thank you so much welcome uh, gurpreet we have one last question from mr vivek mundkar sir yeah vivek hi hello hi vivek how are you hi first time meeting you on uh, <laughs> zoom yeah. yeah yeah carry on with your question actually um, i don't have any technical questions uh, this was just introduced to me by my friend avinash lewis Uh, he said why don't you quickly come on to this zoom and see what's happening there so, okay <laughs> i have just got back into paragliding after okay. a gap of 17 years so oh, yeah 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 we yeah. will yeah uh, well come back you know right now yeah. uh, i used to do a lot of uh, paramotor flying and micro light uh, powered hang gliders and all but i gave it up long back but then okay. now at uh, age of 75 i have got nothing better to do than just start flying again like okay. so hope to come and meet you sometime in beer billing no player play, player would be mine come any time i mean nowadays there's no flight <laughs> and no traveling but yeah when we can please do come yeah but yeah. nice let's hang thank you yeah. thanks uh, thanks vivek for coming in and uh, uh Uh, thanks everyone for uh, uh, actually welcoming vivek uh, the veteran and i see some of my gurus also like ankush online so yeah who taught me the basics of it and yes uh, thanks gurpreet for the wonderful uh, um, insight of all the uh, technicalities involved in uh, flying cool Okay, Gurpreet, that was really nice, and uh, that was one intense session that we had today. Yeah, with a lot of learning. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the pilots. And uh, a reminder to everyone: tomorrow we have uh, Ziad Basil from Dust of the Universe who will be joining us, and uh, you guys should be ready with all your paragliding gear questions. Yeah, look forward to meet you all again at 4 p.m. tomorrow evening. Thank you. Sure, 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 Krishna. It was very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.